Hello everybody, welcome back to our lecture series on microwave engineering. Today's topic is the network theory for microwave circuits. Um, we apply our normal linear network theory to microwave structures and see what happens. I divided uh, this lecture here in four sections. First we look back into our uh, Z and Y parameters. Then I introduce the so-called scattering parameters. And then we move forward to the so-called ABCD parameters, which are extremely useful for calculating microwave circuits. And I end with a tiny, tiny introduction on how to do this using Python. There will be another extended lecture on uh, using network theory with Python. Let's take a look first at our Z and Y parameters. Uh, these parameters are still uh, known from uh, your bachelor undergrads, I guess. And before we jump into that, I have to clarify one more thing. The network theory we look into here is only for so-called LTI networks, linear time invariant networks. That means we cannot apply to nonlinear stuff. Um, what does it mean, LTI? There are basically three major points we have to observe. The first thing, our network must be linear. That means when I increase my input by factor X, I also increase my output by factor X. So when I double my input, this doubles the output and so on. And also superposition applies. So we can either uh, take two signals and put them to the system first and then multiply, or we can first multiply and then put them to the system, which gives you me the same result. It's important for uh, our uh, multiple input, multiple output networks we look into. Then our network has to be causal. That means that it doesn't do anything spontaneous. So we need an excitation in order to get a response. Without excitation, no response. That sounds logical. However, um, mathematically, it's possible that we create a system which responds before we actually excited something. This is basically like a um, uh, a system that can foresee the future, which is not uh, available in reality. That's why we have to restrict ourselves to these causal systems. And then uh, at the end, it must be time invariant. That basically just means that it doesn't matter if I excite my system today or tomorrow or next week, we will always get exactly the same result. Okay, when we obey these three rules, we can now use network theory. I start with the so-called impedance parameters or impedance matrix. Let's assume we have a network in that bubble here and the network communicates to the outside world by ports. So this for example here is port 1, this is port 2 and so on. Each port has two connectors so we can apply a voltage and a current into that port. Now since this all inside this box is linear, whatever we do by uh, changing this voltage here, for example, it will also change the response for the other ports and actually for the port itself. Without going too deep, we can set up now a linear equation system, which consists of uh, a set of n equations. And for example, the first equation is my voltage here at port 1 is equals to some impedance Z11 times I1 plus Z12 uh, I2 plus Z13 I3 and so on and so on. So my voltage I can measure here at port 1 is composed of factors introduced by these N currents. And now we can do this for every voltage for every, at every port and we get a complete set of um, voltages and currents. Whenever I change my current here, it will change the voltages here. Using this matrix expression, we can completely describe our linear network. Basically what it means is once we know all the Z parameters here, we know the complete behavior of that network. If we have a network and we want to know what its uh, Z parameters are, we have to do the following. We can determine 
z parameter ij by applying a voltage j, uh, i at the j's port here and then observe the voltage at the i's port and at the same time we leave all other ports open that means all currents let's go back here all currents into this network are zero except the j's current i have an example in a second that explains that so once again in order to characterize a network for a given structure we excite port j we observe the voltage at port i and we leave all other ports open when we leave all other ports open that implies that my currents are all zero no? except the excited port There's also the inverse representation of the Z matrix, which is called like the admittance matrix or Y matrix, which is nothing else but having our uh, dependent variable is V now and my independent variable is I. So with this matrix operation, we can express the set of all currents at all ports as a function of all voltages. And we get a set of Y parameters now here. It's obvious more or less that my Z matrix is the inverse of the Y matrix and vice versa because it's just putting the matrix on the other side of the equation. When, f when you want to find the Y parameters, you can do that easily with a similar trick. In order to find the IJ's Y parameter here, all you have to do is you excite the j's port with a voltage v and you observe at the i's port your current all other ports must have a voltage of zero that means all other ports must be shorted that way we can step by step determine the y uh, uh, parameters of my network well it sounds a little bit theoretical that's why i have a example here to find the right page okay let's look at this uh, very simple two port network we have one port here to the left and we have one port here to the right port two and port one inside my network i have three resistors um, with some kind of strange impedance values 8.6 ohms and 142 ohms you will see later why i chose this weird values now, what is the Z matrix of the circuit in the gray box? It has two ports. That means what I get is I have um, four Z parameters, one here, one here, one here, and one here. I have to determine now the four Z parameters. Well, maybe let's get rid of this first here because it's in my way. Now, how do I get my Z parameters? Well, let's take a look back at my theoretical calculation. If I want to know Z11, which is this value here. If I want to know Z11, I have to find V1 over IJ. So it's V1 one over i1 um, and leaving the other ports open so i observe my current one and my voltage one and i leave my port two open now when i excite with one ampere or let's say just i1 my network here then this one ampere is flowing through here what is the measured voltage well the measured voltage is obvious here there's no current flowing to the right so the current goes through here so this becomes the series of these two resistors, which is uh, both in theory uh, in series is uh, 150.6 ohms. Okay, that makes my Z11 parameter 
which is a ratio between V1 and I1 when the other port is open to be 150.6 ohms. So I omit the ohms here because I run out of space. Now, what is my Z21? Well, Z21 is, oops, sorry, voltage 2 when excited with current 1. So what is my voltage 2 here when I have the current 1 flowing? Well, my voltage 2 is this voltage here. Let's call it Vx or so, plus this voltage. Huh? However, there's no current flowing here because I2 is 0. Huh? That means this voltage is 0. That means V2 is the same as Vx. Huh? So we can say V2 is equal to Vx. And Vx is I1 times 142 ohms. Now we can uh, divide this by a 1 and we get V2 over I1 is 142 ohms. So this is my Z21. So that Z21 is 142 ohms. Since the network is symmetric, also Z12 is 142 and also um, Z22 is also 150.6 ohms. This is my Z matrix for this gray box. Now, once we have the Z matrix, we can calculate any co current and voltage distributions and see how my network behaves. Alternatively, I can calculate the Y matrix. This is a little bit more complicated. Mm. I have to uh, first short out, maybe let's make a different color here. I have to short port number two. Mm. See that here? So when I excite port number one. So now in order to find Y11, I, ex I excite with the voltage V1 and I observe the current one. What is my current one? Well, I1 is the current here plus the current flowing through this. Hmm? So there are two currents actually. There's one current flowing here and one current flowing here. Um, now, in order to find the current that's flowing here, I have to find the, the parallel of these two. So my R23 or whatever I want to call it is the parallel of these two. And I did the calculation before and I get 8.11 ohms. I put the two in parallel. Now, um, so what's my current flowing through, flowing in here? Well, it's voltage one plus. Um, voltage one divided by the series of this and this. So it's 8.6 plus 8.11 ohms. That makes it V1 over 16.71. Uh, Okay. Now we have everything together here. We know I1 is V1 over this divided by V1. This becomes 16.71 ohms, 1 over, which is when you solve it, which is, which is um, 0 0.0598. Siemens. So it makes Y11 to be 0 
598. Now y21, y21 is y21 is i2 over v1. So when I excite here with v1, what is the current that's flowing through this branch here? No, that's my i2, but a negative direction. So that means we have to apply current divider rule. i1 we know already, which is this. And i2, uh, i2 is now current divider rule. Mm. I'm thinking which is my uh, R total over R branch times I1. And my R total is uh, that's my 811 here. My R branch is my 8.6. times my i1, my i1 is this, no? v1 over 16.71. Now putting everything together, I get some value which I have, yeah, I've calculated it, it's 0.0, .0 five, six, four, V1. So, and that makes my Y21, which is I2 over this, makes it 0 0.0564. So up here, it's kind of small. Uh, maybe can my line a little bit, I cannot make it less thick, so it's, 0.0564 and here it's the same 0.0564 and this is 0.598 this is my y matrix now and you can check using python or matlab you can check that actually my z and my y are the inverse of each other. There would be another way of calculating the y once we know the z here. No, we know the z here. We can just find the inverse with Python and then we find this value. So that's how you did, uh, calculate y and z parameters of any linear network. Hmm? However, that's not our task because in microwave engineering we don't like currents and voltages because we never use lumped elements where we have the current and voltage available. Moreover, in microwave engineering, it's very difficult to measure current and voltage. There's no oscilloscope that measures my waveform at five gigahertz, let's say. At five gigahertz, we can only measure power val values. That means we have to concentrate on the power values of uh, incident and reflected waves. Remember, in the last lecture, we talked about forward and backward propagating waves. And this is another way of characterizing my networks, not by the currents and voltages, but by the incident and reflected waves. Okay, let's take a look at this idea now. This defines the so-called scattering parameters. Again, we have the same network or different network in this black box or white box. And now, we describe what's going at, on at the ports, not by voltage and currents, but by incident waves, V plus here, and by reflected waves. Here V1 minus. So every port has a reflected wave, which is a wave that's coming out of the network. And every port has an incident wave, which is a wave that goes into the network. 
since everything is linear, when I double the amplitude of my incident wave, this will also double the green reflected waves everywhere. And we can write down our network now with this set of linear equations. My reflected wave V1 is composed of fractions of all incident waves here. So V1 is S11 times my incident wave in port 1 plus S12 my incident wave in port 2 plus and so on and so on until S1n of my incident wave in port n. And this is available for all ports here. That makes it an n by n matrix for the number of ports. So that's a basic idea. Rather than using voltage and current, we use incident and reflected waves, V pluses and V minuses. Well, how can I better explain this again? Um, I try. Um, so let's say there's a wave coming into port one here. The wave goes into the network. Something is happening in the network here. And then part of my wave is reflected back out of port one. So incident wave in port one, V1 plus and reflected wave V1 minus. So the, the ratio of the incident to the reflected waves, that's my S11 here. No? S11 is incident wave into port, uh, reflected wave coming out of port one with respect or by divided by the incident wave into the network. These Vs are voltages. No? So every wave has an amplitude and the amplitude is measured in, as a voltage. When we want to take a look at S21, then, well, inside here, when there's a wave coming in here, in port one, something is happening and part of the wave is actually coming out here. That would be my V2 minus. So on this ratio is S21 wave coming out of port 2 divided by wave incident in port 1. Please note the first index is always the observation point. Or measurement point. And the second index is my excitation. This also applies for the Z and Y parameters, but here it's uh, very important to distinguish the two. It's kind of counterintuitive. You always think about, well, there's a, a wave going into port two and coming out of port one because that's the direction. No, it's the other way around. The port is incident in port one and comes out of port two in this case. No, that would be S21. If I want to know, let's say, uh, color there's a wave going into port 3 and it's coming out of port 5 that would be s observed at port 5 incident in port 3 no that would be here fifth row third column s 5 3 that would be this parameter so in, in doing so we can now build up one S parameter after each other. How do we determine the S parameters from a known network? Well, there's a similar idea. Um, however, I forgot one thing to mention, which is kind of confusing. However, I have to mention it once. They are so-called generalized scattering parameters. With the scattering parameters, you have one problem. The problem is when you when your ports are referenced to not equal port impedances. Let's say you attach a line here that has an impedance of 100 ohms and here this line has an impedance of 50 ohms. Then the amplitudes keep changing just because of the change of impedance. 
In practice, you rarely do that. That's why it's in practice not a big issue. However, you have, we have to be precise here. In order to avoid that problem, people came up with the idea of a generalized scatting parameter. Rather than observing the voltage directly, V plus, we observe the normalized voltage. Voltage divided by the square root of the impedance of that port. With this trick, we normalize our amplitude voltage to a funny value A1, A2, A3 for the ports. They have the unit volts per square root ohm, which is a really weird unit. However, in doing so, once we square that value here, we always get V squared over ohms, which is the power of the wave. No matter what impedance you have, the A is now the square root of the power of that wave. That way we avoid the impedance problem. Well, since in our uh, circuits we take a look at in the next two months, all the lines have the same impedance, this problem doesn't occur. That's why for me it's the same as saying A or V, it's going to be the same thing. Okay. How, nevertheless, when you be precise, and that's how it's written in books, you re do not relate the incident wave. That's my incident wave magnitude to the reflected. Reflected. So, but you relate the normalized incident wave amplitude to the normalized reflected wave. That's why it's usually written like this in books. Okay. Good. Coming back to our actual problem. If I want to determine my parameter Sij, what do I do? I have to find the ratio of the reflected wave B to the incident wave A. B at the I's port to A at the J port. And we have to make sure that all other incident waves are zero. When all other incident waves are zero, that means, well, let's go back to my big picture here. There's no V plus anywhere here. No? How do I make sure that there's no V plus except the exciting port? Well, when we leave that open, this is not a good idea because when there's a wave coming out, open reflects and puts it back in. In order to make sure there's no reflected wave, we have to load all other ports with its port impedance such that nothing is reflected. No? So that's done in uh, on, on a sheet of paper, but it's also done when we do a measurement in the lab. We have to make sure all ports have been terminated by the correct impedance. Usually this is a 50 ohms impedance. No? So we have apply a wave here and all other ports must be matched. When we apply a wave here, we see our waves, green waves coming out and get sucked up by that load. So, so when doing that, we can now excite my port number J with the voltage and then we observe the wave that's coming out of port I and this ratio is my Sij. Doing the calculation is, mm, yeah, kind of complicated. And uh, there's a trick I, I'm going to tell you in 20 minutes. It makes it much easier. That's why what I'm showing you right now, it's not the usual way of doing it. It's just to tell you how it's in principle done. One last note before I do that. When we give somebody the S matrix, the scattering matrix of my network, I have to give two additional information. I have to give the reference impedance of my ports. Usually it's 50 ohms, if not uh, otherwise. And also I have to give a reference plane. Um, this is this little blue dotted line because when the wave is coming in and going out, depending on where I'm on that line here, I change my face. That's why you always have to tell the person um, who's looking at your S parameters, what is my reference plane? In practice, is usually the 
plane where the connector is of your circuit. Okay, let's calculate the S matrix of this network here. Um, it has just 250 ohm resistors and that's a two port. In order to find S11 and S21, we have to excite my network at port one and I excite it with the matched source. So I have a voltage here, I have 50 ohms here and I excite my network from the left. Again, I'm doing the, the quick turn here because that's not the way it's usually done. Nevertheless, we have to go through it once. First, we can determine the voltages just by using classical network theory. We know V1 and V2. This is just the voltage divider here. Uh, V1, and I am just give you the result. V1 is uh, 3 over 5. V0, because this is 50, 50, this is 100, uh, this is 25, so it's 75, 125 over 75. And V2 is, um, when you, it's 1 over 5 V0. So that's what you can find straight forward. The V1 plus is something um, that can be yeah, calculated in two ways. One way would be uh, using our knowledge about a matched source. And again, I take a little shortcut here. Maybe you can ask me later if you need more information on that. V1 plus is the wave that's leaving my source under optimal conditions when there's nothing reflected. Under optimal conditions, half of the wave is going into my internal resistance and half of the wave is going into my load. That's the so-called available power. That means that the actual voltage V1 plus is one half of V0. As I said, without mm, much more detail, I just tell you that's the way it is. So, now we have all the relevant information and calculate all the other Vs. We know V1 is a combination of V1 plus plus V1 minus. V1 plus we know, or V1 we know, it's uh, 3 over 5. V0. V1 plus we know it's 1 half V0. And that way we can determine V1 minus. That makes V1 minus to be um, 6 over 10 minus 5 over 10. Then this becomes, uh, too careful, uh, 1 over 10. Yeah. V0. So. Let's mark the important equations down here. So this V1 minus is this, V1 plus is this. So we know these two Vs already. Know the same calculation for V2. Well, V2 is equal to V2 plus plus V2 minus. However, there is no such thing as V2 minus because, well, the wave V2, V2 sorry, uh, there's no V2 plus. Oop, let's go back. I made a mistake here. There's no V2 plus because the V2 minus is leaving my network and at this side, the network is loaded with 50 ohms. Remember, in order to calculate the S parameters, we load all other ports with its matched such that there's no plus wave coming in. That means my V2 minus is nothing else but V2. That makes V2 minus to be, what was V2? 1 over 5 V0. So maybe let's mark that here. Okay. Now, 
now we can calculate our s parameters maybe in blue s11 is v1 minus by definition over v1 plus that's what's reflected out of port one when i'm coming into port one and this is v1 minus is this over v plus so it's one over ten over one half which makes it one over five so s21 is v2 minus over v uh, sorry v1 v1 plus which is 1 over 5 divided by 1 over 2 which is 2 over 5 so. so in this calculation we can calculate now that my s matrix we have our first two parameters is 1 over 5 and s21 is 2 over 5 When I keep going, I have to do the same thing now, switching the ports. Basically, I excite now port number two and load 50 ohm onto port number one. And I don't want to do this here. Maybe you can try at home. Then you will figure out that S12 is also 2 over 5 and S22 is minus 1 over 5. And this is my solution for my complete S matrix. So that's a complicated way of calculating the uh, S matrix of a network. You can imagine that it becomes more complicated when you have complex loads and even more complicated when you have complex loads that change over frequency, like a capacitor, for example. That's one of the main reasons why nowadays these calculations are done by computer programs. You can do it, use either Python or you can use one of these professional tools like Microwave Office. So here's my calculation and my results here, plus and minus five and so on. Just for curiosity, you can calculate, for example, S11, which is my reflection here, no? wave in port one reflected out of port one. S11 is nothing else but my reflection coefficient at port one. Reflection coefficient at port 1 is 50 ohms and my load is this impedance and this impedance is 50 plus 25 so it's 75 ohms. So that way I can say S11 is the same as my reflection coefficient at port 1 with my Z in being uh, 75 ohms and my Z not being 50 ohms. And when you put this in, you get the same results. That's another way of calculating S11 and S22. Now, <coughs> um, the S parameters are very often used for two port networks where you have an input and an output. And when you do that, you can easily translate them to Z or Y parameters. There's a, actually a formula for converting S parameters and Z parameters and vice versa. That's one way of calculating S parameters. You calculate the Z parameter set and then convert it to S parameters. When we have a lossless network, there's an interesting fact. Um, when you think about it, well, all power that's flowing into this network here must come out. So the power that comes in here must come out. So um, P in is P out coming here plus P out coming here. So, so the incident power must be the addition of the power coming out of port one and the power coming out of port two. The power that's flowing into port one is my V1 squared over my impedance. Uh, the impedance I leave out because it's the same for everything. That's one of the reasons why we usually normalize that. The power that's coming out of port two is my incident 
uh, sorry, my, my reflected wave, the wave that's coming out of port one, squared. The, volt, the power that's coming out of port two, it's the reflected wave of port two. So when I divide this now by V1 plus, I get one is equal to V1 minus over V1 plus squared plus V2 minus over V1 plus squared. This here, V1 minus over V1 plus is nothing else but my S parameter one. This here is nothing else but my S parameter S21. That's why I can say the following. S11 squared plus S21 squared is equal to one in a lossless network. However, only in a lossless network. Otherwise, there will be power loss inside the network and this does not apply. That's an easy check on uh, calculating if my network is lossless or not. More general, this applies to n ports. We can rewrite it as it's written in textbook that my s times s conjugate complex becomes my unity matrix. When you do the math, you will actually figure out that this works out. Okay. Next point or one more note on S parameters. The power um, that's, well, uh, no. let's talk about reciprocity and reciprocal networks. Reciprocity uh, is defined as the response of a system is unchanged when source and measurement are exchanged. What does it mean? I try to illustrate this here. When there's a wave going into port one, does something here and coming out of port two, let's say we put 0.1 watt in here and we get 0.004 watts out on the other side. Now, what happens when I switch cause and effect? Basically, I put in my 0.01, uh, my 0.1 watt now into port number four and something happens here and something is coming out of port one. And interestingly, what's coming out of port one is also 0.004 watts. That means when I flip my network, it behaves exactly the same input to output, forward and backward direction. And this reciprocity applies to all linear time invariant networks, except some very strange things, which I show you in a second. And we can use this as a general rule. The uh, all passive linear networks are reciprocal. That means that my Sij is equals to Sji. So on the, uh, we can flip our S matrix on the diagonal and it's symmetrical about that. That's why we can say that S is equal to S transposed. Very important fact and very important in microwave engineering. This also applies to antennas and uh, filters and things like this. When you transmit from a base station to a cell phone, it has exactly the same effect as going from the cell phone to the base station. There's no difference. It makes life easy. The proof for reciprocity is very complicated. You have to look in uh, electromagnetic theory books. There's always a chapter on reciprocity on, and the reciprocity theorem, which is a three, four pages calculation. And you can see that it, this is actually the fact. One more thing about S parameters. They are very often measured in decibels because they describe a ratio, a ratio between the reflected wave to the incident wave. And since the waves are voltages, converting my, my S parameter into a dB value, I have to say 20 times log 10 of my S parameter, not 10 as for power, but 20. Please keep this in mind. More often you will see S parameters written in dBs than you will find them written in absolute values. For passive structures, this means that since the value is usually smaller than one, you always get negative dB values for your S parameters. There's also a special word for it. 
the negative S11 value in dB, it's called the return loss, RL. Whereas the negative S21, which is also S12 since it's reciprocal in dB, it's called the insertion loss. Because that's the loss you get when you insert your device. Before you have just a transmission line. Now you insert your device. And by inserting the device, you get a loss from left to right. And that's a so-called insertion loss. Whereas the return loss refers to the reflected power that's not going into the network. And it's also kind of a loss because it doesn't go into the network. That's why it's called the return loss. Okay, here you see that uh, the S parameters are usually vary with frequency. And that makes it complicated for hand uh, written derivations because it keeps changing with frequency. You have to lot of, do a lot of calculations. And you usually plot the S parameters versus the frequency. You know? And you see a very typical behavior of a two port network. In this case, I just used a low pass filter. And there's a wave going into the low pass filter, a wave coming out, and there's a reflection, and that behaves like this. The, the S21, my orange curve, that's the power or the, the magnitude that's going through. You see below one gigahertz, most of the power goes through, and then above one gigahertz, it's highly attenuated. And then here, practically at three gigahertz, there's nothing coming through. No? The reflected power, S11, is first it's low, it varies between 0 and 0 02, and then at very high frequencies, all of the power is reflected. No? So at high frequency, wave is reflected, at low frequency, wave goes through. No? That's what this tells me. Since the filter is lossless, the two curves intersect at 0 0.7, that's 1 over square root 2. No? When you find the power from that, you have to uh, square that, so it's 1 half. At this point, one half of the power is reflected and one half of the power goes through. Here more power is reflected, here more power goes through. So now we can convert this to dB values and then it looks like this, ex ex exactly the same filter, just written as dB values. You have one uh, at low frequencies with almost zero dB, everything goes through and a tiny bit is reflected, minus 20, minus 25, minus 30 dB. It goes up and down a little bit. And at high frequency, almost nothing goes through. So you get here, for example, at 2 gigahertz, you get already 38 dB attenuation. Huh? So. And uh, almost everything here is reflected. So that's the typical behavior in dBs. Again, here at minus 3 dB, the two lines intersect because minus 3 dB means half the power. So half the power is reflected and half the power goes through, which is exactly the same point as here. So it's at one point something gigahertz. No? Now, um, when talking about the insertion loss, here, my insertion loss, IL, is plus 38 dB because it's negative of my S11. No? This is actually done very often wrong, even in data sheets, but the insertion loss is always positive and the S21 is negative. No? It's just the, in, uh, the, the negative of the other. No? But people and engineers know about it, that this is often done wrong. You see a lot of publications where it says IL is minus 38 dB, even though that's not true. Okay, let's do one example and then we have a little break. Um, let's assume we have a two port network and one half of the incident wave go through the network. So let's say here. So one half goes through. We come in here with one 
and one half go through. No, no let's draw some connectors. You know what I mean. So a wave with an amplitude one and one half go through. That means that let's go back to black or so. S two one is one half. When S21 is one half, then uh, in dBs, well, one half in dB, it's 20 times log, it's actually minus six dB. No? And uh, when we look at the power, then one half of the magnitude is one quarter of the power. No? We have, uh, So actually what we have is 25% of the power go through. No? So that would be for S21. When we look at to a fraction of 1 over 100 is reflected at port 1. Maybe let's take a different color here. So from this 1 that comes in, 100 amplitude wise is reflected. And that makes my S11 to be 1 over 100. 1 over 100 in dB is minus 40 dB because it's 20 times log. No? So power-wise, this is 1 over 10,000, no? um, which is 0.01%. So when we have a a return loss or insertion loss of minus 40 db that means 0.01 percent of the power is reflected that's actually a very very small value when you do the same here for the 1 over 10 on the other side i'm running out of space so when you're excited from the other side there's 1 over 10 coming through that makes s to 2 is 1 over 10 in dB it's minus 20 dB and uh, this is power wise it's 1% uh, of power so just to get the, the value sorted out when you have a match of minus 20 dB that means you get 99% of the power into the network and only 1% is reflected that's usually considered a good match no? when you have minus 20 dB so here I put all these things together. You can take a look. It's also in the lecture notes where we can do this. Oh, yeah, uh, if you like, you can do the calculation S11 squared plus S21 squared, which is not one, which tells me that there's actually my network is lossy. Okay, let's have a little break and then we continue with the second part.